All right, well, folks, welcome back to another episode of YWC Football Talk, as always, sponsored by the Bet Stamp app. This is episode number 161, and today with me, it's a little bit of a different podcast. It's a team that I've never had on before, and with that being said, without further ado, from Locked On Vikings, I have Luke Braun. Luke, how are we doing today? Doing good, doing good. As as we record this, I'm waiting to see what uh, Patrick Peterson is going to announce where he's going to play. <laughs> Breaking news is always good news, especially when I'm recording. I've been burned quite a few times, like a lot of podcasters, mm-hmm. where news breaks the second you hit the stop button. Yeah, no, it's gotta it's gotta break while you're going. That's when it's fun, which might happen here. So, <laughs> and you know what? If your eyes are off to the side, I can go on and vamp for a little bit. It's all good, um, but. <laughs> Since we're here and talking Vikings, because I know the Vikings are in a, I don't want to say different, but I want to say the word unique position going into this season. I know it's only March, but obviously with the firings of Zimmerman and Spiel, uh, Zimmerman, excuse me, Zimmer and Spielman, I was much different names. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, much different, much different. Um, where with O'Connell and uh, I'm tr- trying to think on the pronunciation. Quasi, Quasi, Adolfo Quasi. Mensa. Yeah, Adolfo Mensa. With those two guys coming in, what's the vibe around like the fan base and the team? Like how? Like when I said different, I meant like because you guys obviously are in that spot where you can be in the playoffs this year or you can be outside. It's just that's that's mm-hmm. Minnesota Vikings football to me. <laughs> yeah, well, I, throughout their whole history, they've been that. They've never been the kind of franchise that goes you know two wins. They've had one two win season and it was their second ever season. Um, so th- they've always been that kind of team. I think uh, since being an expansion team, they haven't had a playoff drought more than four years. They're always in it. Um, so yeah, that that's always, and, and the Wilfs know that and respect it and want to keep it that way. Um, and I think that informed all of these hirings. So kind of what we had was, you know, you hire Quasi Dauphimensa. He's an analytics guy. He's a wall street trader. We're going to do economics. We're going to be, you know, everything, you know, f- get rid of these running back contracts and we're going to do the analytics thing. And um, then they kind of didn't do that. Then they hired <laughs> Kevin O'Connell, who was basically tailor made toward we are trying to maximize Kirk Cousins. That's the the deal of Kevin O'Connell is that he's the the Kirk Cousins pick. Um, so they hired that guy who's worked with him before, who's supposed to be like this QB, you know, this he's he's a QB coach mostly. So he's yeah. he's going to develop and he's going to work with Kirk and make sure he's in the right place mentally and all that stuff. Um and then they extend Kirk Cousins and then they do a couple of void year things and they restructure some contracts and they miss out on the guard everybody wanted. And it's like, this is, feels like a Rick Spielman offseason. And so a lot of fans are getting kind of antsy because this doesn't feel very different yet. Um, there are some things that are different. You know, there's they they went out and did the Zadaria Smith deal is something I don't think Rick would have done. Um, and they've been a little bit different with how they do contracts and stuff. Um, but really it, it doesn't feel very different yet. It feels like they're going to say, oh, well, let's win, go, go nine and eight with Kirk again. And we're good with that. Obviously they're not thinking that, but that's kind of how it feels. It feels like they're just careening toward maybe the seventh seed, depending on tiebreakers again. And that, yeah, I, I think the excitement that came from, yeah, we're going to have an analytics GM wore off real quick. Yeah. That's, Cause that's the one thing I just felt too. Like, obviously I always said this in 2020 when they extended both Zimmer and Spielman, when they said, I was like, oh, okay. For some reason, 2020 felt like a red shirt year for the Vikings in the sense where it was like, okay, you know what? Hey, if they finished, I think it was seven and nine or eight and eight that year, missed the playoffs. It was no big deal. Then 2021, you guys were expecting different. And then down the stretch is really when it cost you. And now I kind of get the same sort of sense with the Vikings. With school, look, I don't know what the nickname for Vikings fans is. We'll say, I'm just going to say the school, school fans just for fun. Hurt people is fine. Yeah. Masochist. Hurt. Maskal Kist is one of my, my listeners. Is Maskal Kist is pretty good. Can, can I, do I have permission to call the podcast Maskell Kists? Do, 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 <laughs> do I have permission? Well, you have to ask that guy. Okay. okay. <laughs> so my thing for getting it then is like going into this year, obviously, you know, the offseason hasn't gone exactly to plan. Like you've said how there's been a lot of non-analytically driven signings. I would is, I would oh, say not necessarily that just because Rick did more analytically minded things than I think yeah. he got credit for. It just feels very similar to the old way. We thought this was going to be a lot of beat writers and a lot of like content people really thought this was going to be a teardown. They thought, you know, we're going to trade away Eric Kendricks. We're going to trade away Adam Thielen. We're going to trade away Harrison Smith. We're going to fix the books. We're going to get a bunch of draft picks. We're going to tank. It's going to be a three win season. Get rid of Kirk. And we're going to, and none of that happened. And it seems like they're just like trying to be competitive, even if that's maybe ill fated. Now it's like, Oh, we have to, we're going to go try to win a super bowl with Kirk cousins for the 10th year in a row. Certainly it'll work this time. You know, it just isn't, isn't inspiring people the way it was supposed to. 
the path I was going to go along to, because I actually do want to talk about Adam Thielen in a little bit, but I feel like this year with you guys, it's that I always thought 2022 was going to be the year once I saw the O'Connell hiring. This is like back about six weeks ago. I thought that hiring was going to be, you know, more, hey, this is a year where we go for it all. You know, you push your chips to the edge of the table. Obviously, the Justin Jefferson contract is going to be coming up very, very soon. That He's mm. getting his mold as a yeah. But that was my philosophy. And then if anything would be, you know what, 23, 24, 25 of the years of pain for the Vikings if you don't reach that goal. Because let's be real, the NFC North right now, you have the Lions and the Bears who are clearly in rebuilds. Even though, like, Ryan Poles came in and said, like, basically what you thought the Vikings were going to do, the Bears did. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, the forever loved Packers of the <laughs> Minnesota Vikings fandom uh, decide to trade their best player. I know Aaron Rodgers is the MVP, but Adams is their most skilled player. So it's a very interesting division that I still feel like Green Bay technically can win. But I feel like Minnesota is a team where, look, you can take advantage considering where a lot of teams are right now and that there's some teams where you look at three-fourths of the NFC South, probably not going to make the playoffs or are going to be very close, even though one of those teams has experienced – pain inside of your stadium a very very bad pain <laughs> and then um the the east and the west it's a wait and see experiment so i feel like minnesota still can make the playoffs but do you think it's more of a team that can you know what surprise some people and make a potential run to be in arizona next uh february or is it that purgatory where you think the vikings are good enough to make the playoffs but not good enough to win a super bowl where do you stand when it comes to that uh, you're you're asking a weird guy at this question um, Ooh, okay. look, I, the Vikings, I don't think are a contender with Kirk cousins. I just don't think he's good enough. Um, and I think it's just that I, I think he has, uh, snags in his brain that stop him from taking the kinds of chances you need to take, especially in those major moments. Um, and you know, they, he kind of lives to fight another day, but he never actually picks a day to fight on. That's the way I've been saying it. I've gone in way more depth on my show. I won't bog you down with all that, but I don't think they're a contender with Kirk cousins yeah. as long as they have him. Um, and it's not a contract thing. It's about his play and flaws in his game that he abjectly refuses. Even when publicly asked, he refused to, to address them. Um, and I just don't think that's going to change. Kevin O'Connell would disagree with me. Oh. I would say, no, no, no. I, he, and he's been very, he said, we're going to quiet his mind. We're going to get him in the right space. You know, there's all these other things. He's had some, com and he's kind of referencing the, the mistakes he thinks his predecessor made and said, you know, well, this didn't really work out. That didn't really work out. And we're going to try to do it a little different. And Kevin O'Connell thinks, I can turn this guy into the quarterback he always can be. And if he's right and I'm wrong, Kirk Cousins is top five quarterback and we're in everything. Yeah. Absolutely. If if Kevin O'Connell can quiet Kirk Cousins' mind, get him to play loose, get him to feel and not think so much, get him to really get into the, 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 the rhythm of the game is, is a, a phrase O'Connell uses a lot. Um, then he has all the ability in the world. The arm is there. He's got enough mobility to run around. He just has to decide to do it. He has to decide to leverage all that ability and he's afraid of it. Um, and if O'Connell can get that out of him, then sky's the limit for sure. So to go back to your original question, um, that's that's where I think it is when it comes to contender or whatever. But yeah, once you're in the dance, anything can happen. I am a firm believer. It is a single elimination playoff format. St. Peter's beats K Kentucky sometimes. It happens. Um, and in a, in a single elimination format, just get in the dance and anything can happen. It's going to be tough to win the division as long as Aaron Rodgers is in it. Always has been. It has been since 2008, right? Um, and and 92 before that when Favre was there. So, like, it's always going to be a tough division. And I, I think that some fans prefer it that way. Um, but with how weak the quarterback slate in the NFC is, like, even the most ardent Kirk Cousins haters can't really argue that he's worse than like sixth best in the NFC unless you want to have like really, really weird takes about somebody like Jameis Winston or something. Um, so I, yeah, I think they can make the playoffs and maybe anything can happen, but I don't think they're going to be like favored in a lot of playoff games. It would have to be an improbable run. Yeah. It's like one of those miracle runs kind of like, like what we kind of saw Cincinnati go through this year where, you know what, Hey, you get in, you beat, you beat the Raiders, they beat the Titans, then they upset the Chiefs in overtime, and then they get to the Super Bowl, ultimately losing to the Rams. Uh, I like the Kevin O'Connell analysis you gave where he thinks, you know what, hey, let's quiet his mind, let's get back to him to playing football. Um, but at the same time, too, I feel like at the same time, now it's more or less, hey, Kurt, it's up to you. You have to go out there. You have to get it done. Um, and I still feel like, too, at the same time, with this new regime, do you feel pressure from the – do you think they feel pressure from the Wilfs to win immediately? Or do you think there's more – the Wolves are kind of knowing, hey, it's a new regime. Let's give them a year. And then 2023 might be the year where it's like, okay, guys, we got to We got to figure it mm -hmm. out and figure it out now. Uh, I, I take Quasi on his word. 
And if you go listen to what Quasi yeah. said, he's been asked this question plenty. Or not about the Wilfs. The Wilfs, I think, they don't want a dead team. They don't want to do what the Bills have done. And I think that was, well, Ryan, they didn't actually get to the second interview with Ryan Poles. Poles took yeah. the Bears' job before he even got to the second interview. Um, but I don't think they were aligned on that. And I don't think that would have been a good fit then. Um, because, yeah, they they don't want to go 3-14. and 14. They don't want to be an unwatchable product. And I think part of that's business, right? You got to sell tickets and you have to be at least good enough to be worth somebody getting season tickets at the beginning of the year. And and I agree with that. I don't want to be a Jets fan, man. That's hell. I would much rather have a team that I can at least like think about, you know, and I can I can at least enjoy watching on Sundays instead of the the torture that is being like a Lions fan or a Jets fan. So I don't want that. And, and, and the Wills don't want that either. But I think that's the only pressure. Otherwise, I don't think the Wills are coming in and saying, you know, my guy is... Kirk Cousins and you're going to keep it. No, it's how are you going to make this team competitive and keep them competitive? Um, and if your plan involves becoming uncompetitive, um, then I don't think the Wolves would be interested in it. And I don't think that that's Quasi's plan. Quasi talks about this, you know, we want to live in today and tomorrow is the way that he puts it, where we don't want to have to sacrifice long-term for short-term and we don't want to have to sacrifice short-term for long-term. Let's make decisions that live in both worlds. Let's make decisions that make us better in both scenarios instead of trying to max min max one or the other. Um, and I, and I certainly agree with that both as a fan, as somebody who you know covers the team and how good the team is, um, like affects my <laughs> business. Yeah. So there it is. Um, I just saw Patrick Peterson put on the Vikings hat, so there's that. Okay, uh, there you news. go. Bra breaking news. Here we go. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I wanted him. I, I I really like him as as a Vikings guy. They got a lot of young corners. I like him as a veteran presence. Um, it, it'll be interesting. I don't think he's as good of a scheme fit for what Donatell is doing as he was with what Zimmer was doing, but still good. Like he's he's still pretty good. Um, still pretty good corner. But I, I don't think it's going to be as good. Um, but I'm 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 less worried about that. I think I like it just as I mean they just have a lot of young players. They need a, they need a, an adult in the room. You know. Exactly, more so for veteran leadership to kind of lead the way. Um, and no, I get what you're saying. Where the Wilfs, they want to what they want a watchable product. Even though, look, there's a lot of those years where it's just 500 to like you know a borderline medio mediocre. And I'm not trying to insult the Vikings or anything, but you know what I mean, right? When the football's, <laughs> it's not as good. It's not yeah. as good, but you know it can be better. Um, I, I like look. I know I have a football podcast. Obviously, I have a favorite team. Um, I'm not gonna. I don't want to say who, but I'm just gonna say I've had 20 enjoyable years with that with my with my boys so far with my team. Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'll break the ice. I'm a Pats fan, but I like to talk. That's, that's why fun. I yeah. I, so that's why I started this podcast too, and I've gotten to know more teams and more fan bases, and that's why I wanted to get you on because I was like, look, um, the Vikings are a team I've never really gotten to go in depth on, but I've always been curious by and i had the same thing when i had a card i actually locked on cardinals recently uh alex oh, cool. Pines. yeah alex yeah. on here a few weeks ago yeah, and I got the same. <laughs> i got the same perspective from him so i get to learn about different teams and everything and that's why like i've liked our conversation so far um i also feel like too with this team i just want you to answer a question for me i feel like too with the o'connell hiring it's they feel like it's different because it's like okay we're trying the hey we had a defensive head coach for Mike yeah Zimmers, he's an offense and guy and that's kind of as deep as anybody yeah. ever goes yeah, yeah it's, and it's it is like, it's different. Yeah. And he has a, a different philosophy. The Wilfs are really focusing on collaboration. That's been their whole thing. And it's been, you know, at the end of the Mike Zimmer era, it got very contentious with a lot of things. And I think he yeah. just kind of knew the writing was on the wall about he's going to get fired if we don't make the playoffs. And you can tell that season they weren't making the playoffs. And I think he handled that real bad and stuff got weird. He stopped talking to Spielman. He, players felt ignored, kind of uh, things that had been brewing had been had started to leak out and stuff. Mentally checked um, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it was, it's just a really bad way to handle that, you know, like finish the season, dude. But um, I, I think that has really made the Wills want to overcorrect the other way. Um, and I don't even mean overcorrect as a bad thing. Like get collaborators, get people who are going to work together, get listeners. Quasi is a listener. And, and he will tell you that's one of his greatest strengths is that he will hear the people who are saying stuff to him. He'll listen to his advisors. He'll listen to the people around him. And ultimately he'll make the decision, but it's not, you know, my way or the highway. It's come in. It's it's open exchange of ideas. And Kevin O'Connell learned the same thing when he was in the in, in uh, New England with your Patriots. This yeah. is, that's the Belichick way. The Belichick way isn't this gruff Matt Patricia nonsense. The Belichick way is is open exchange of ideas. And I think Kevin O'Connell really took that when he was Tom Brady's backup, and he took that everywhere with him. And he'll talk about that to you too. Um, so yeah, that's that's the I, I think the. The thesis is, A, we're going to work together better than we did. 
And we think Kevin O'Connell is going to be able to get more out of Kirk, get more out of all these players. And then otherwise we're going to keep this together, try to tweak it and run it back. And essentially the, the pitch, and I don't know how much I buy it, but this is the pitch. Kevin O'Connell will make us, will get us over that hump. And instead of being eight and nine, we'll be, you know, 10 and seven, we'll be in the playoffs and then anything can happen. And they basically are relying on coaching holistically outside of, you know, the improvements of something like his Adarius Smith and hoping some people get healthy. They're essentially saying, Hey, we think this team is, was coaching away. Yeah. Like, um, sorry if you're barking in the background, that's my <laughs> dog, but um, I feel like it's one of those help me help you help you kind of thing. Like, like, does that, does that work? I know I've been throwing a lot of words in your mouth and everything like that, but like, it's like a help. <laughs> like, sure. Yeah. Like it's like, an exchange like, of ideas. It's you're yes. an intern, you know, you're a QC coach, but if you see something and you say, Hey, I think this might be an idea that works for this next game. It'll be heard in, in, and that's the way it is in new England. Um, Yes. You know, if you're, it does not matter who you are. It, there are some interviews I read with Patrick Graham because he was one of the finalists for the head coaching job and I was researching him. Yeah. Um, and when he was in new England, I mean, he was a low level, nobody. And he was like in the room talking to Bill Belichick about stuff. And Belichick would like take his ideas if they were good. And it's that that open exchange is, I think, part of what makes the, the Patriot way so successful. And that's not a mystery around the league, um, except, you know, then you get the the Pat, Matt Patricia types who run it, you know, or the Joe judges who try to who who mistake the Patriot way for being this like true authoritarianism. Um, yeah. And that, yeah. That's why I felt like that, because that's the thing I want to say, because obviously going to the NFC North and Patricia, I knew it wasn't working out because what he basically did, like, why Vrabel's, I know Vrabel's not a direct disciple, but Vrabel's kind of like took in what the Patriot way is, put his own twist on it, and made it work. Brian Flores tried the same thing. Obviously, look, that's a very sensitive subject right now. We don't know the full extent of why the firing happened, and there was a whole, there's a whole lawsuit going on right now with him and the Dolphins and the NFL, but I feel like with Patricia... It was right. You're right. It was just that general, no, Patriot way is, you know what, disciplined football. Right. You're, you get in the building at 5 a.m., you leave at 10 o'clock at night, or you're mm. here longer. It's one of those things when in reality, no, everyone you're right. yeah. hated it. Uh, exactly. Like they still talk about it. I mean, the, the Lions had a decent core of talent when he took over, too. Like, they had Darius Slay in there, and they had good defenders and guys like Trey. And, Kenny Galladay. you know, Quandre Diggs. And, all of those guys are now vocally like, Whew, that was rough, y'all, right? Like, they hated him. Yeah. And he did so much damage to that franchise that they are a year away from being two years away right now. I mean, yeah. there's just no hope at all. It's just the darkest period of the Lions since they went 0-16. And, whew, like, that's I, not the way to do it, man. I still feel like with the Lions, though, there's like, I feel like they have a sense of, I, which, by the way, I know you're a rival of them, but I am very excited for them to be on Hard Knocks this coming summer. I feel like that's Oh, be sure, yeah. It's going to be very entertaining. But that's the thing, though. I feel like it's – we're bad. We know it. But we know that there's, like – I think they kind of, like, they've made a light at the end of the tunnel that's not just false hope for them to look forward to and say, like, two to three years from now. I think that there's, like – Oh, a, I think it's very false. Oh, no. I'm not saying, like – when I say hope at the light at the end of the tunnel, I mean to be a decently competitive team, not we're going to suck for yeah. – years and years on end we'll see what happens it's just that's how i've perceived it where i feel like some of the guys have bought in but no it's it's still going to be growing pains where they're they're a two to two to maybe four win team for the next few years yeah I, with the lions i'll believe it when i see it i think there yeah. are are factors in that organization that go beyond just who the coach is or who the gm is and it's not a great start with brad holmes either going and getting jared goff and stapling the franchise to that and that wasn't lip service that wasn't just oh we'll take the contract and be bad for two years they legit believe jared goff would save the franchise and, and, and that's i question your decision making ability yeah that's very question decision making ability but then with them too it's also with teams like and also I want to say this too, and I know he's gone flack and also too he had trouble a few years ago, but like when there's there's ownership being involved and there's ownership being too involved, but there's ownership not being involved. Like I feel like with the Wolves, they're involved, but they're not too involved. It's like when like a good owner knows, hey, we're, I, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong. But I, with good ownership, they know like what Kraft does with Belichick. I know Bill Belichick's good enough, he does things his way, and they work. But mm. with Wolves, like, do do you feel like there's a similar approach? that there was with the Wolves, or do you feel like there's, because I know they're not in Minnesota full-time. I believe they're in New Jersey for most yeah, of the yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, they, but they do show up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I just, wanted, I just wanted to see if you, like, w with the Wolves, if they, if it's that similar approach, because I feel like with the, with the Lions, like, with them too, ownership situation has been weird too ever since, uh, 
I was supposed to say Ralph Wilson since William Ford passed away. I think it was like 2014 mm. or 2015 to where I feel like they're in that situation with ownership where you either got to get more involved or you have to sell the team to someone who's willing to put the money down to get involved. Cause that's why I feel like that's been the impression with them, but you're not a Lions fan. You're a Vikings fan. So let's focus yeah. on the Wolves. I prefer owners that butt out. The, the, these guys are real estate developers. They don't know Jack about football. Yeah. You know, I, I uh, can respect a little bit. I, all they want is please just don't make the team uncompetitive in some weird fantasy land where that you are awarded with a Super Bowl as long as you pay your dues and get your one in 16 season. And then for that, you get to be a Super Bowl team because of the one high draft. They, they don't want to live in that land. They don't want to live in Jets world, right? Yeah. Um, they want to live in a world where we can continue to be competitive. And then if we don't win the Super Bowl, we improve them as much as we can next off season and we go try it again, but they don't want to get worse. And, and it's like a very high level thing. It's make the team competitive. And I, I can respect that. Although I would prefer ownership that is just million percent hands off. You're the football guy. You do the football thing. We'll sell the tickets and, uh, you know, good luck. And we'll, you know, we'll hire you. But I think once we get through this, this off season, um, this is a bit of a, a higher level transition, right? You're transitioning from Rick Spielman who had been in the building for 16 years. They're overseeing that a little bit. My hope is that once you get through that and you have a direction and things are kind of off and running, the wheels will sort of back off again. Um, but they have, they were involved in, of course they were involved in the GM search. They were heavily involved in the coaching search. Um, and they were heavy and all of ownership was heavily involved in the coaching search. Um, and they, I think were pretty involved in the Kirk Cousins decision as well, which was, you know, if you can't get a better quarterback than Kirk Cousins, don't change quarterbacks. And for me personally, I would have been okay with taking a year, um, to find that, you know, get rid of Kirk, set yourself up with draft picks and, and cap space and stuff. So you can set yourself up to go draft a quarterback in 2023. And if we're a little awkward in the meantime, I'm okay with that. They're not okay with that. Yeah. Um, so that's the pressure from the Wilfs. But I, I definitely won't, don't want him any more hands-on than that. If anything, I want him less hands-on than that. But I can at least understand it. Yeah, like that's the thing, too, where I'm going to go back to the Patriots perspective on it with Robert Kraft, like what I was saying earlier, because he had his – it's also a good week to have you on because, look, there's a league meetings going on in Florida right now, a lot, a lot being discussed, a lot going on. And Kraft basically said, like, look, I'm a fan first. But then when he was asked about Belichick and the coaching titles, he's like, Bills knows what he's doing. So like, that's where I feel like – look, you're right. You Like, I understand them, though um, – I do this a lot. My bad. I jump. My mind's a really jumpy place. Oh, um, me too. Oh, yeah. Um, they, that's why I feel like doing a podcast is perfect for me. Um, because exactly. I just bounce ideas off people. Yeah. But with Robert Kraft, he basically came out and said, "Look, Bill knows what he's doing. What he does works. I just kind of let him do his thing." But then I feel like with the Wolves, it's a similar approach. What you want, you want the hands off. But I understand them though being involved in the management search, like you said, like the last time Rick Spielman started working there when I was twelve years old. That's mm -hmm. how. That's how long he's been there. I'm 28 right now. Um, and then with Kurt and then hiring Kevin O'Connell, I feel, and also Quasi, I feel like, yeah, I, I get them being involved in those decisions because one, it's your star position and it's your two most important hires. You want them to be involved. But then once that happens, if they want to assemble their staff, then you let them do that hands-on. Same thing with the draft. Hey, leave it up to the scouts, leave it up to management, leave it up to the coaching staff. That I get, that I get. And that's what I like. That's where I wanted to bring in that whole example with, how there's involved being involved too much and not being involved at all is a dark place you don't want ownership to be in. But I get at the same time too, though, the Vikings ownership, you know, hey, we're not going to bottom out. We want to fill U.S. Bank Stadium. Let's let's be honest, one of the more beautiful stadiums in the NFL. Oh, hell yeah. And a place I'd like to visit, maybe get to one day. And, uh, and you want to be able to sell tickets. You want a product that, you know what, the fans may not be happy all the time, but it's a product they can be proud of, and you know that not only are you going to get people tuning in, you're going to get people watching, or even listening to, because there's a fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but I know that the play-by-play -play guy for the Minnesota Vikings is, I want to say the network's K-Fan, and I want to say yep, his name Paul is Allen. Paul Allen. Paul Allen, yes. yes. I know that because of various football podcasts. Oh, you know all the – oh, well, he's on the show. So you probably have heard a lot of his famous calls, too. Yeah. Um, I, I think the Patriots are playing in U.S. Bank this year. This they year are. Year. Yep. Yeah. Which I was even going to set up because I was going to ask you off air, which would be a perfect time. Maybe, uh, hey, whenever that week comes around sometime in the fall, you and I could chatter it up back once again for you that game to get both perspectives from uh, both sides. Sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, future commitments. Love it. Yeah, get um, me on. Absolutely. The next thing I wanted to ask you about was something I addressed earlier, but we kind of put off because we went on various subjects. Um, 
which um, a trip to a trip to Minnesota could be on my books this year if all plans out well. Um, I actually don't live near, and surprisingly not, I don't live in Massachusetts or the United States. So getting to Foxborough is my top priority for this year. But if I if I got a little little something something left over, then you know what, Minnesota could be in the cards unless it's in December. No offense, just don't want to go to Minnesota in December. That's fair. That's fair. um. I, I live in L.A. That's oh, you're not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I live in Toronto. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um. So two very opposite ends of the uh, globe right <laughs> yeah. now. Um, I want to ask you about Adam Thielen because he, how you said he was a trade hmm. chip earlier. Where where do you view him with the franchise right now? Is he still are they kind of like more? Like he's because he can still put up numbers. Obviously, he was a little banged up this past year. Yeah, uh, Justin Jefferson taking over. But where do we view Thielen? Like, is it on the way out, or do you think he can be like a, a Viking lifer, if you will, where in ten to thirty years he's blowing that horn at the at the beginning of games and, or banging the drum? Yeah, I think even if he retired tomorrow or if, you know, they traded him tomorrow or something, I think he still is going into he's going to be blowing the horn before games for sure. I mean, he's a Minnesota yeah. hero because he's a local guy. Um, they just redid his contract. In fact, the details of that were released on Wednesday here today. Um, they made a little bit of cap space and he actually got a little more money and a greater commitment from the franchise. Oh. So they committed to him. Um more for the next two years. They actually added a void year and stuff. So it's harder to cut him, harder to trade him. Um, so I, I think he's he's locked in. And I like that. Adam Thielen never was, I mean, he was always a good enough athlete. Like he was always a plus athlete. He was an above average athlete. Undrafted. But that was never how you um yeah, yeah, undrafted, but his he like ran like a four 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 in the 40. Like his drills were fine. He was just a small school kid, so he didn't get drafted. Yeah. But his craft is in his routes and in his ability to uh win contested catches like it's gonna age very well he has the skills to transition into this next phase of you know in, when he was younger he had athleticism and the skills and that made him one of the top 10 receivers in the entire league you know that made him big threat you know big play deep threat dude pair him with stefan Diggs, and it was this like super fearsome pairing um, and now I think in this next phase of his career, he enters the part where he's more of a possession receiver, you know, a little older, but he still is valuable and he's still a guy. And, and they might, because of the contract shenanigans they've done, they've done, they might be paying more than what that's worth. Um, but it won't be, I mean, he's not going to be last year's Larry Fitzgerald where he can only play for 10 snaps a game kind of thing. You know, he, he still will be, I think in this next year, he's still the second best receiver on the team unless the age cliff really, really hits him and KJ Osborne overtakes him. But I think that's a really, really unlikely thing. Um, And I think his game ages very gracefully. It's, it's about know-how and technique and he has like the subtleties and nuances of his routes are art, man. It is so cool. Like how he sets you up and knocks you down and both Stefan Diggs and (laughs) very, yes, very much he's going to be a good fantasy value because everybody's going to underdraft him because he's they think he's old and he's going to get tons plenty of uh ppr right but yeah nice um but like both stefan Diggs and justin jefferson have taken tricks out of his book and added him to added them to their game and have kind of taken it further that the blaze out route that if you ever watch stefan Diggs run that that was feeling and Diggs learned that together and now justin jefferson has it um and honestly, KJ Osborne's getting it too. Like he he has that influence on the locker room as well. I mean, leader type and all that stuff. I mean, he's somebody that I, I think he just has to be a, a lifer and he's going to be in the ring of honor someday. And it's, yeah, it's he's just a beloved dude in, in the state. Yeah, that, 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 I, I totally forgot until you said that, that he was a local guy. And you said that I believe it was like Minnesota State mm-hmm. or something like that, which is like believe- Mankato. Oh, Mankato. It's where, their, it's where their training camp used to be until a couple of years ago. Which it's somewhere within... The- I think it's somewhere it's than Egan now. Yeah. Yeah. Egan, I know. It's, yeah. I think it's them. It's closer I think, to the actual cities. I mean, it makes sense. Like, it's like how I, I know them. They're like Egan. And then I think it's, and then there's Inglewood with an E, which I believe is the Broncos. So it's what it's like where the E's were coming in for me. Cause obviously look, a lot of these NFL facilities aren't exactly in downtown cores, but the Vikings is one of the rare ones where the stadium still is in the downtown core and surprisingly not named targets target stadium, just because I feel like every arena in the, yeah. Greater Minneapolis area is named yeah, Target. Target Field, Target Center, and then they got US Bank Stadium. Yes, on the former side of the Metrodome. Um, mm-hmm. One more question before we get out of here: Perfect Vikings draft for first round pick. I've seen many different players. Do you like if you were drafting? If you're Quasi, do you go offensive line? Do you go corner? Do you help shape up the linebacking core? What exactly do you do, or what play, or not exactly what do you do? What's a player that you're targeting? 
Yeah. And I, I'm glad you asked it that way because for me, it, I, I get this question. I do a, a Twitter Tuesday mailbag every week, every week on, on Locked on Vikings. And one question that always comes up is who are you taking at 12 or what position do you think they should take at 12 is what it is. So, you know, wide receiver or cornerback at 12 or wide receiver, Ed Rusher at 12 or whatever. And I, and my answer is always, what does a wide receiver mean? What does a cornerback mean? Is that a, a small corner? Is that Stingley, Derek Stingley? Is that Sauce Gardner who's on the board? How, what's their skill set? Are they bigger? Are they faster? Are the, what's their deal? Do they play, sl- do they play inside or are they only outside? Like all of those questions are really, really important. And depending on the board, my answer to this is always going to change. Um, you know, a couple years ago, 2019, the only cornerback they could have drafted was Greedy Williams, and I didn't want any part of him. So no, they shouldn't have taken a corner, even though they absolutely needed one that year. Um, and then so f- to answer that this year, if I could weave the fates and manipulate the gods and have any board fall the way I want to do it would be Kyle Hamilton somehow falling to 12 because of his 40 time that's never happening but if I could weave the fates if I could manipulate time if I if I could call up Dr. Strange and get him to do something I would have him do that for me otherwise um Sauce Gardner also is a bit of a pipe dream a little bit of pie in the sky but I don't know maybe something weird happens with him and people get worried about I don't know that people love to talk themselves into some random guy falling way further than they're supposed to every year so something like that could happen of more realistic options I like Derek Stingley I'm not worried about his um his his foot at all I'm not worried about anything weird that happened in his three game COVID season whatever um yeah I'm I'm into to Derek Stingley get me another LSU corner now to pair with Patrick Peterson by the way that'd be really fun and Justin Jefferson and all that, like we're basically like LSU North, <laughs> um, and overtaking get, Cleveland. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's I got it skull, but with the E A U X. Um, but yeah, that I, I would love that. I, I think corner is a big priority. You know, Patrick Peterson now is part of can paper you over, but he's old. And they kind of have no depth outside of that, or they have only depth outside of that. They don't really have like starting quality, inarguably starting quality players. So that's what I would do. But any old Georgia guy, basically anybody off that Georgia defense, um, I'm I'm game for anybody off that front, any of those edge rushers or whatever. Javon Walker has fallen sometimes. Um, and I don't really care about the position redundancy there. You know, he's just a stud. Take the stud. Um, that that's kind of where my board is at right now, but as the draft season evolves, as the, the next kind of month passes, I'm, I'm going to definitely like work on that and evolve it. Yeah, exactly. Cause I look, look, that's before, that's a big thing too, where this year's draft, this year's draft, obviously, look, you can go for once. I know there's always the infamous video of Spielman and Zimmer laughing two years ago, both on my, I don't, I'm trying to remember if it was the teams or zoom. <laughs> when they realized, yeah. You know, when Ray was the went, zoom draft. Yeah. And then the Eagles took Regor, which apparently was just Howie Roseman going rogue, and all his scouts said, "Don't do that." Uh, and Howie Roseman did it, and then Justin Jefferson falls to us. Yeah. And then I just remember the video of them laughing, being like, "All right, cool, like, yeah, get get that ticket, and we're yeah. taking Jefferson." They were like, "What? He <laughs> fell?" Yeah. And I still think you guys won that. Dr- you basically that was a trade where both sides won. Digs to Buffalo, you guys getting Somehow. Jefferson. That was a trade where both teams won. Um, I like twelve. I like like look the corner class this year is great. This year's class, like I said before, it's about I, and also I know you said you hate the guy earlier, and I feel like that was a joke, but this Alex Clancy says it's best with his Cardinals. You have to eat <laughs> yeah, your veg, you have to eat your vegetables before you eat your dessert. That's what this draft is a lot of. It's a lot of, you know, you gotta draft what you need, not what you want. Like I feel like with Minnesota this year, you know what? Yeah, you can draft a corner. Um, there's offensive linemen, but I still see that there um actually there's a podcast listening to from PFF where they were saying how there's a lot of uh, scouts and like NFL personnel as um, sorry, I got something in my eye um, who are down on some players, but they feel like they're purposely doing that in hopes that they fall. But in reality, they won't. But I feel like, look, if there's a corner at 12, you like if it's Stingley um, potentially could be a steal in the first round. If he falls outside of the top 10, because I know there was points where he was going top five, but now I think the big boys up front are dominating this top five. That's, that's just me though. But even, one other player, I don't know if you know too much about Charles Cross out of Mississippi State who's been dropping. If he was there, uh, I haven't gotten into him yet. Go look at the film. I think he's someone that can help. Compliment Garrett Brad uh, Bradbury, which I believe he's going into a contract. Is, like, is Can he play guard or is he just a tackle? Because they're set at tackle. They got Christian Derrissaw they took yes. in the first round, and Brian O'Neill's a pro bowler. Yes. Uh, but I believe he's more of a I, – let me actually, let me look this up quickly just because it's kind of uh, piquing my curiosity. 
across. I just want to make sure you get the right positions and everything down. Uh, Charles, he is a tackle. Never mind. So you guys are good. You have Darius. Well, sometimes Brian. tackles go into guard, and that's like the deal with yeah. them. But that's that's what I would be. That would be my first question when I look at Charles yeah. Cross. Is is it feasible? Is it smart to move him in, or is he a guy like um, oh god, what is his name? Sam Cosme. The he was yes. a Texas tackle. Absolutely shouldn't move that guy to guard. And so he if there's the a guy like this in this class, is that it? Yeah. yeah if there was a guy commanders. like that in. In, in this class, I would be, I'd be like, yeah, he's he's not on the board because they clearly have their future at, at tackle. Um, and all you're really looking for is depth and you shouldn't use a first rounder on a guy who won't get snaps. Yeah, exactly. That was, that was just one thing I wanted to throw out there. I didn't, I, I, I completely brain, brain, uh, completely went in my head. The I remember Darius off pick, but I totally forgot Brian O'Neill. Really good, really good lineman. But I know you guys do need guard play. So we'll see what you can see yeah. what's out there, see what's out there, explore it. But look, I think this year's draft is about plugging holes, it's about building for the future. It, it's draft season. That's I'm just going to go on to think quickly and say why I started a football podcast because the NFL truly is the greatest reality show on television. And Correct. look, we're five months away from the season and you and I are talking in depthly about a team that I do not know a yeah. whole lot about and that you love. Yeah, well, stay tuned. I'm going to uh, tease something. Um, stay tuned later in the off season to the Locked On Vikings YouTube channel to learn, uh, especially for people who are unfamiliar with the Vikings. Going to do some stuff I think people are going to like a lot. Sounds good. Well, anyway, Luke, before we go today, I just want to give you the opportunity, if, say, people out there aren't too familiar with the Vikings or don't know too much about you or where they can find you, I'm going to give you some time, plug all your information away so the sure. viewers can go up, viewers, listeners can find you. Sure. So if you are interested in listening to uh, NFL wide stuff, if you don't care about the Vikings, I'm unlocked on NFL. Um, you can find that free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Um, you can find me on that on Tuesdays. It's a rotating cast. So that is a show, a daily show, Monday through Friday. I happen to host Tuesdays. Um, also, you can find Locked on Vikings, same thing, free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And uh, you can find Monday through Friday there. You can also find articles once a week and twice a week in season at zonecoverage.com, which is a Minnesota sports website that I write for. And you can find me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL. And the show is on Twitter at Locked On Vikings. Sounds good. Well, anyway, Luke, it's been a great blast getting to talk to you today. We'll uh, see a little bit more about what this Vikings team truly is after the draft and see where they're going. And then you and I will chat again soon. And then, like I said before, when it's that Patriots Vikings week, we'll definitely have to come on here and give each other a hard time and hoping that uh, one of our teams yeah. is victorious. Yeah, let's get weird. I love it. Love it. Let's get weird. Um, I'm still sticking. I don't know who you are. If you are out there, I am sticking to Skull, Massive Skull Kists. I'm sticking to it. I know I butchered <laughs> the pronunciation. I am sticking to it because I love it and I love to use just like Perfect. simple puns as everything else but before we go also to luke thanks for rescheduling on me i know i had the bail on our first interview but it's always good to get it done yeah, that's right. but anyway guys you can find us anywhere join me sunday for a live uh and i'm gonna say this too i don't know if you're a fan or not but sunday obviously is wrestlemania so join us for a live live stream before the show sunday as ywc there is a wrestling component to it so we'll be uh chatting football before the wrestling begins but anyway guys i will see you later and thank you very much to listening to this episode any episode and to luke once again for coming on have a good night everybody.